what is going on welcome this is the uh, live stream we're gonna be talking about buzzing the lips and buzzing the mouthpiece I know that this is gonna be uh, real helpful for a lot of you so thank you for joining me and uh, bear with me I man I tore my studio apart a little earlier and uh, had to put it all back together I got some slides and stuff put together for you guys so hopefully uh, you know you're gonna find all this real helpful and of course if you've got any questions put any of your questions in the comments and uh, you know I'm gonna address them that's what this is all about this is a, uh, a dialogue this is a discussion it's a demonstration and I'm gonna be talking about uh, lip buzzing and mouthpiece buzzing because I know that's a that's a hot topic for a lot of people and it's something that I really find very beneficial and it's something that I've been doing for many years so um, if you have any uh, trouble hearing, uh, let me know, and we're going to get that all dialed in. I created a couple uh, play-along tracks, so uh, we're going to uh, we're going to do some demonstrating on the lips and on the mouthpiece. So um, excited about that! I have to upload one of these real quick, but I think uh, otherwise uh, we're uh, we're basically good to go. So I've got some slides here. Let me pull these up. So that, so that we can get to work here, all right? And uh, here we go. Buzzing the lips and mouthpiece, all right? And of course, at any point in time, if you got any questions, just uh, put it in the chat below and uh, we'll talk about it because that's what this is all about. All right, buzzing the lips and mouthpiece. And uh, just just curious, how many, how many of you out there are doing this already? You know, let me know in the comments. Are you already doing mouthpiece buzzing are you doing lip buzzing you think it's great you think it's horrible i really want to know your opinions because i've i've heard it all i've heard it all from everyone um jack o'reilly writes do you think playing too loud on the mouthpiece can spread your chops too far apart yeah i think playing too loudly on on the trumpet or on the mouthpiece uh can can spread your chops too far apart however uh there's some really easy there's some really easy guidelines and tips that are that I've got that should hopefully really help you to not get in that position where you're not feeling like you're getting too spread. All right. So, uh, you know, let me know if you got any more questions as we go along. And Quad Striker writes, I use a product from Stomvi called the Upsound instead of Mouthpiece Buzzing. Yes, that's a great thing. And that could be a whole other po uh, topic. Uh, buzzing accessories, you know. There's, there's the Upsound, there's the Burp. A lot of people use that. Uh, there's different devices from different manufacturers. And a lot of them, you know, basically aim to achieve a similar, a similar stuff. Um, and then we've got another comment here. Art is fine, of course. Great stuff because it is the real instrument. I love that. We're going to get to that um, as well. And let me, uh, I'm going to just move forward here a little bit, all right? So this is a biggie. This is a biggie. If you're new to buzzing, all right? If you're new to buzzing, uh, don't overdo it, all right? If this is your first time and you're just getting into it and exploring, um, start easy. Don't overdo it, all right? Uh, a lot of people run into difficulties with buzzing because they, like, dive into it and they're like, oh, I'm going to do it. And and um, I think it can be a fantastic tool, but just like anything, you know, if you overdo anything, it's going to be too much. Overdo long tones, too much. Overdo lip slurs, too much. Overdo running, it's too much. So, like... We got to do it in moderation. Really very important. All right. Um, so just this is as a preface, like this is my approach. All right. A lot of people are going to explain it different ways. But, um, you know, this is how I really love talking about buzzing. So buzzing is not a direct analog for the trumpet. All right. It can be a terrific diagnostic tool for checking our air, setting up our chops, getting the air moving and getting the ears working. And, uh, I think that's really a lot of the greatest benefit of buzzing. It's it's a fantastic ear training tool. Uh, it gets our lips moving. It gets our air moving. And you know, this is if if you're tuning into my my live sessions and if you've checked out my other videos where I talk about uh, you know more more technique, um, common theme: really getting the air moving and keeping it steady and consistent and full. And Buzzing is just a terrific tool in order to, you know, really 
use as a diagnostic to make sure that you're doing things the way that you think you're doing them. Because a lot of us, uh, a lot of us aren't necessarily always doing what we think we're doing, and it's and it's difficult to really know for certain. Uh, so that's why I love buzzing. All right, lip buzzing. What's lip buzzing? How do you do lip buzzing? Some benefits. And then we're going to demonstrate. All right. That's the plan uh, for this first section here. So lip buzzing, the way that I do lip buzzing is, is uh, as part of my warm-up. And, you know, I use it. It's like, it's like stretching. It's like getting things moving, getting things ready to go. Some people would call it like, you know, if you do it really loose, like flapping. But I'm actually doing pitches. All right. And it is all a breath attack every time, always. I'm not tonguing. There's no tongue involved. It's just air getting the lips to move. And when we can control the pitch and then we can control, um, you know, changing pitches, then we're really controlling our air speed. We're, we're you know, the change of velocity, the, the volume of air. And, we're, of course, we've got to use our ears to make sure that that's all really dialing in. Uh, so how do you do lip buzzing? If, if you're really having trouble with it and you're just like, you know, I have a feeling most all of you, you know, can get a sound of some sort with your lips. And the thing that we really want to make sure is that we're not too tight. It's so easy to be really tight on buzzing. And I love lip buzzing, actually the octave below or even two octaves below. I start my lip buzzing very low on like a pedal C or a double pedal C and I move my way upward until then I get to the mouthpiece and then and then I'm in the trumpet range. And there's a couple reasons that I do this and a couple takeaways. Um, when we buzz on our lips versus on the mouthpiece, um, it's not a direct one-to-one, -one, all right? Now, this is something I learned from Roy Popper. This is something that James Stamp used to talk about um, all the time. Malcolm McNabb talks about this. A lot of the top people out there um, we'll talk about the relationship between the lips and the mouthpiece with regards to buzzing as as being an octave difference, you know, or even more. And what I mean by that is... So did you hear that? I'm buzzing. Take it off my... Take it off my face. It's an octave below. So... We're not... We're not buzzing the same note with our lips for our mouthpiece, all right? It's a tool. This is not a direct analog to playing the trumpet. It's a diagnostic tool, and it's a way that we can really um, learn to control our air, control our lips, you know, get things moving here, get things feeling good. Uh, you can develop a good position with mouthpiece buzzing. We're going to get into that. But with lip buzzing, nice and loose and relaxed. And that's going to help us getting getting things moving. All right. And uh, some benefits. To me, really, the benefits of lip buzzing, besides what I've mentioned, is like it really gets the blood moving. It just gets things happening. And if any of you have ever like been on a team and you've done sports and like you got to warm up and, you, you know, this is just a great way to get things moving, get the blood flowing. A lot of you, if you haven't buzzed before, you're going to notice like your lips are going to start tingling a little bit. And that's just the blood coming in and out. So. If we, uh, uh, you know, if, so don't be alarmed by that. If you're feeling a little tingling in your lips, that's just the blood making its way through. And that means that, that you're, you're uh, doing the right thing. Your lips are vibrating. And art is fine, comments. Exactly, because buzzing alone, if you go up there, it has a tendency to stretch. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, I think I know what you mean, but I want to make sure. So I've got some more slides here. All right. This is uh, this is in bass clef, and this is the piano, and I did a recording of this. So you're going to hear this is uh, this is what we're going to do in just a minute. And um, yes, that is a uh, that is the equivalent of us doing a double pedal C on the trumpet. So um, C, pedal C, the note below. That's that's where I start my lip buzzing, really low, and. You know, here's here's the biggie. This is for lip buzzing as well as mouthpiece buzzing. 
when we move from note to note, really like the primary focus should be that you're using your air to reach from that first note to the next note, not your chops. We never want to, we never want to like grab down on our chops to try and move to the next note. Increase, blow the air and you're going to reach the next note with your air. Um, no worries about the interruptions here. Tendency to stretch lips. Yeah. Um, if we buzz on the lips too high, it can, it can be problematic. Um, and before we get into this exercise of playing, all right, just in just a moment, um, I will say I've been buzzing for a long time. This is my 21st year. All right. It's crazy. It's been a long time since I was a freshman at Oberlin, um, back in 2002 and that's when I first learned about buzzing. That's how long I've been doing it. I've been buzzing practically every day since then. Uh, so that's a lot of days. All right. Now, what I've got here is uh, a audio track that I created. And let's, let's put this uh, audio track on. So this track right here is going to have a metronome. You can hear the clicking going on. And uh, we are going up diatonically. So if you look at this, we're going up diatonically. Um, exercise, uh, you know, going through and going up. And what that is going to do is ya da 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 da, right? Do re mi fa so fa so fa, right? Ba da 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 da. As opposed, uh, we're going up chromatically. Pardon me, chromatically as opposed to diatonically. On the mouthpiece, we're going to be going up diatonically. So um, let me play this and. Uh, we are going to be on the lips only, and there are some chords that are going to play on the piano, so you're going to hear the pitch, and we're going to uh, just go through this, and uh, you know, check check out whenever you need to, and uh, I will see you in a couple minutes at the other end once we uh, once we get this done. All right, so buzzing, warming up, play along. Make sure the volume here is right level all right here we go perfect Ooh, re uh oh I gotta figure out how to restart this give me one second here I got a lot of uh, new pieces moving all right here we go So you got to take a really big breath for this to work. Yes, the entire next section after this is going to be on mouthpieces. I'm going to pause that for a second. So hopefully the balance between the audio track and the buzzing that I'm doing, I try to move the microphone away, is cool and makes sense, and you can hear the track and go along to it. So um, this is 
this is the type of exercise that I started learning on and that I started doing. And, uh, you know, there's so many different ways to do this. However, you know, this is a simple pattern and you can just kind of take the pattern and you can go up chromatically and you can go up, uh, you know, as high as you would like. And the goal here, as I mentioned, is really just kind of... getting the lips moving and working and you know getting that control and the balance between your air and your lips you know really uh that's what we're going for balance between air and lips um any questions uh we can jump back in doing a little bit more of this uh, but i do uh want to make sure we got any more questions art is fine right stamp did it should be something about it yeah stamp this is where I got a lot of this from, from Roy Popper, studied with Jamie Stamp, uh, also from Michael Sachs, I studied with, and he studied with uh, James Stamp. I had, uh, Hokan Hardenberger was just here in Chicago this past week, gave a brilliant concert last night. He was talking about Tebow, as was uh, um, Stephen Burns, lives here in Chicago. They both studied with Tebow, and you know Tebow has also uh, a lot of... Uh, you know stuff that he that 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 he does uh, similar with stamp. Uh, so this is uh, uh, you know just a great exercise for for gaining control over the lip buzzing. So is there anyone here got questions about you know what we should be doing? How do we, you know anyone here struggling or or having you know difficulty even just like getting that to start at the beginning? Because if you do, then all the rest of this exercise is, uh, uh, you know, going to be a big challenge for you. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I'm addressing anyone's concerns that you've got here. Um, I will say that with the mouthpiece buzzing that we're going to get into in just a minute here, um, the same with the lip buzzing. No tongue. We're not tonguing. It's just... Right? Just controlling it. Uh, with our air. Uh oh. Hold on a moment. My apologies here. Let me put this as a full screen. I was shooting this event last night, and uh, the concert. I'm going to be posting some pictures. I think on my Facebook um, with uh, with Hokan Hardenberger. It was a uh, brilliant concert. Let me grab a new battery. I was so busy putting together the slides for this event that <laughs> I guess I wasn't uh, uh, thinking about the uh, the battery here too much on on my camera. All right, so let's uh, get back into this. I'm going to uh, get back to this track, do a little bit more. Here we go. sound loud because I'm pretty close to the microphone, but, you know, mezzo piano, soft. So, real quick, why why 
am I using the pattern that I'm using? Uh, anyone here? Uh, anyone here familiar with this pattern? You've used it before. Is there a? Uh, you understand the reason why it's ya da 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 da. Anyone uh, want to chime in on that? I'll give you a moment here to uh, write your comments if you are. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, give you the explanation here, but uh, you may be may be able to guess it relates. It relates back to stamp. So stamp, in his uh, in his method, he used to use fermatas a lot. He used to put fermatas on top of notes, and the fermata was kind of like a way that you would hold on to the note, um, because the the big thing stamp was really you know uh, uh, getting at with a lot of the exercises that he did was he want he wanted to make sure that you weren't um, telegraphing the direction that you were going because it's really easy if you're going ya da 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 that by the time you're at ya you're already kind of like thinking downward and dragging downward so um stamp would take uh you know these exercises and and kind of like the highest note he would put a fermata and hold it that way you really settled into that note so all this is is ya ba da 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 but ya da 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 da, and that's just a way that we can maintain our air moving forward, and making sure that that we're not you know telegraphing and going back downwards. And uh, you know he had a lot of a lot of great sayings. You know uh, you know whether it was like think up as you're going down or think down as you're going up. You know just kind of vice versa, just so that you weren't projecting where you were going, so that you weren't like you know, telegraphing the direction that you were about to play. Because if we do that, then suddenly we start ending our notes early, we start leaving our notes early, and that puts our chops in a precarious position. So this is uh, this is the strategy. This is what I do for my lip buzzing. And you can see, like, look at this. Like, it, it goes through all the way until, um, you know, as high as I wrote on this, you gotta even make this uh, full screen as high as I wrote on this. Um, was really just a you know kind of like a D in the staff for us, so not too high. But remember, the relationship between the lips and the mouthpiece is not a one to one. So if you can buzz on your lips a low C, if you can buzz on your lips a G in the staff, you could play a high C. I mean, you've got enough chop, you know strength and whatnot to be able to do that um it it really it really uh you don't need to buzz that much higher on just your lips um no one needs to buzz a high c on their lips uh it's incredibly difficult you know even a c in the staff is 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 higher than most people need to um ever on their lips thoughts on using visualizer always seem to get Short-term benefits and tension starts creeping in more consistently. You know, I've actually never used a visualizer. That was not something that, that Roy um, had me use or work with, and that's not something that I really worked with anyone else. However, I know a lot of people who benefit greatly from them, and there's a lot of fantastic tools out there. Um, and just because it works for me or, you know, or doesn't work for me doesn't mean that, that it would or wouldn't for you. Um, I like to use the mouthpiece because I'm playing on the mouthpiece. You know, I mean, this is what I use. This is what I use to play trumpet, so I want to keep it as, as similar as possible. So now let's jump in for a minute here. Uh, mouthpiece buzzing, all right? Mouthpiece buzzing. This is something, again, I do every day. And so the lip buzzing, we didn't go through everything. Um, however, I have. I feel like you 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 get it like yo da 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 and you can sit down at the piano and it's really gonna you know just help you kind of get loosened up and then ready for the mouthpiece so uh let me know uh let me know in the comments are you ready mouthpiece buzzing do you do it every day do you do it at the beginning of your session do you do it in the middle at the end did you used to and you no longer do uh curious about you know everyone who's watching and we do it so what's mouthpiece buzzing well it's 
plain and simple as playing the mouthpiece. I mean, we're playing the mouthpiece. And I feel like a lot of people make mouthpiece buzzing more complicated than it needs to be. And, you know, it doesn't need to be really tricky. It doesn't need to be really complicated. So uh, that's where we're going to talk through these items. So tips for effective buzzing. All right. Um, tips for effective buzzing. Here. Generally hold the mouthpiece, okay? Don't smash it in your face. Stamp used to recommend that people hold it about, uh, you know, that far down, maybe like a third from the bottom, and two fingers loosely. I'm not like grabbing it tight. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of loose in my hand. And I'm using my left hand, and my right hand is my dominant hand. Um, the left hand actually holds the trumpet, so it would make sense that we would hold the mouthpiece with the left hand as well. But the less dominant hand is is another idea um, that I learned from Roy, and, and that's basically just to keep us from smashing in our face and, and using too much. So, um, you know, a good idea to think, you know, to do that. Breath attack only. I've mentioned it already, but breath attack only. So poo poo attack or you know uh, whatever it is that you use for the breath attack but remember the breath attack gets the lips together the air pushes through the lips creates the vibration we have buzz focus on the air not the chops all right so important and really the most important thing that we can do with buzzing and this is something that roy uh really kind of dialed in and 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 like you know tried to try to like reinforce all the time was was the importance of just the first two notes, right? The importance between um, that we're using our air for those first two notes, as opposed to, can you hear the difference when I grab with my chops? I'm like tightening, I'm, I'm reaching for the notes with my chops. Sound immediately cuts off, gets smaller. When you use your air, <laughs> you hear the difference? The fullness in the, in, the, in the sound. And again, when I'm buzzing, not buzzing really loud. Mezzo forte at most uh, because Again, buzzing is not a direct relationship to the trumpet. And a, uh, a piano, pianissimo buzz on the trumpet, on the mouthpiece, a mezzo forte, a mezzo piano buzz on the mouth is going to be forte on the trumpet. You know, like it, it really it really translates to be much, much louder. All right. And uh, benefits. These are the, these, this is what I love. There's some huge, big benefits of mouthpiece buzzing. And number one. Ear training. When we play the trumpet, the trumpet like funnels us into into each note, right? Because that's the way that it's built. It's like if you had a bottle, or I'm gonna take a mute here. This mute, it wants to make that sound. Whatever combination valves you have down in your trumpet, your trumpet wants to make a wants to make a sound in that harmonic series, and uh, it's gonna funnel you to the closest note and the more in sync your signal you're sending the trumpet is to where the trumpet wants to be the greater resonance and you know centered your note is going to be so that's why buzzing so great because it's really like you it's helping our ear training because we're hearing the pitch and we're creating the pitch and we're directing our air and our ears to then you know work in conjunction and coordinated with our chops and all that works together until we get the pitch that we're looking for and it really just helps us dial everything in um, so in that regard then air control buzzing is really just fantastic for air control and as I've mentioned uh, a couple times this can be a terrific diagnostic tool and what I mean by that is when we buzz on the mouthpiece um, what we put in is what we get. And we're immediately going to hear if uh, 
you know, if we're wavering, if it's, uh, you know, if, if it's not steady, we're going to hear it immediately. If our air is, is kind of backing off. A lot of people, you know, in their playing, uh, use a lot more energy at the beginning of the note than they do for the rest, for the middle of the note and, you know, filling it out. They just have a tendency to naturally back off because the horn is going to respond still. But, um, you know, buzzing, it, we're going to hear that immediately. And if we can keep that full, constant airstream, it's only going to make things easier. Um, art is fine. Ear training, what Hokan said. Real listening is listening before the note. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, if we can hear it, we, we can play it. Um, if we can't hear it, good luck, right? You got to be able to hear it. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, you talk about Thibaut, talk about all these old, uh, you know, the French, French school and, 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 you know, go back some decades to, uh, you know, a lot of the the, the teachers of our teachers, and so many of them were big in on solfege. So many of them were big on singing. And uh, last week, uh, Hokan at his master class was talking about uh, different opera singers. And, you know, it's like so many of them were, were big on, on solfege and singing because it forces us to really hear what's happening. And mouthpiece, if we're going to buzz a pitch on the mouthpiece, we got to be able to hear the pitch in our head in order to make it happen. And that's, uh, that's something that I just absolutely love. Um, so then I'm going to say here, natural mouthpiece placement and, uh, and, and sound production. All right. So, um, what I mean by that is the very, and this, I know I have a tendency sometimes of going, you know, over explaining, going on tangents, but this I think is, is something that is not really talked about very often. And uh, this is a discussion I've had with, with uh, Michael Sachs and, and others um, about how the mouthpiece as a tool can really help us with, with horn angle and, and playing. So, um, so many of us in our formative years while we're playing, we're in band, we have teachers, we have band directors. They're like, hold your horn up. If you're in marching band or, or you know, if you did uh, DCI, one of those, like, it's ingrained in you. Hold your horn up. And, like, because it's visually something that they're looking for. And for most people, you know, you want to have a good posture and you want to hold the horn up at a nice level so that you project and you're not playing into your stand or playing. That being said, um, sometimes, and uh, sometimes it's very often, like, that actually like programs us to play the trumpet in a suboptimal angle for what we should actually be playing, like how we should actually be approaching and playing the trumpet um, for our own physiology, for our own facial structure, for our, our jaw and, and teeth and lip structure. Because the mouthpiece, if we're just removing the trumpet from it, then we don't have to worry about holding the trumpet and all of the back muscles and everything that was involved in that and the years of habit. So we can take the mouthpiece and say, okay, this is what's comfortable. I don't know what pitches I was starting on, but you know, that's a good position for me. It's comfortable. I'm able to go through all the range that I need to I'm going to grab my trumpet here and just kind of demonstrate something. I made a video about this, but um, here's the idea. All right. So I didn't change my, I didn't bring myself to the horn. So many people, they pick the horn up and then they like bring themselves to the, they meet the horn. You've changed your entire posture. You've changed the angle of your throat, of your of your neck, of your head. You've possibly like constricted your airstream, and this is all things that we don't even realize or think about, uh, particularly as young as young developing players. So uh, when we buzz, we can eliminate all of that, and we can say, "Okay, that's where my body wants 
my mouthpiece to be. That's the angle. And then, okay, cool. Put the horn up. And then that's where I'll play from. And that's what I do. And really, uh, um, I found that to be so helpful. Ryan Green writes, I have to tilt my head back to get in the right placement when I do. Yeah, exactly. That's not good for our playing. I mean, it's not beneficial from like a, a, a pure um, production standpoint, you know, what works best for us. And that's why it's so challenging and difficult when you have these situations where they're like, hey, everyone, um, you know, hold it like this, right? So buzzing, in my opinion, actually can really teach us and show us so much about where our body naturally wants to place the mouthpiece. And then you just have to basically put the horn on there without adjusting, you know, look straight ahead, buzz, get the mouthpiece, you know, the trumpet, put it there. And then it's like, oh, it may feel, it may feel awkward, but just try it. I promise you're going to sound better. Um, it, it really is a, uh, um, pretty illuminating. So on the mouthpiece, the exercise that I do first every day is, uh, you know, very similar to what we just did on the lips. If you've been here all along and however, instead of it being chromatic, it's diatonic and we're going up, going up and then let me see if I can, there we go. Oh, perfect. This is nice. So we're going up, we're going up and then continue. And then they get, then they get more expansive and you know, I'll buzz on the mouthpiece up to a high C down to a low C. And this last exercise very often, I'll take it down even an octave further. So let me play this track and let me know if you have any questions. So mouthpiece buzzing poo. That's what we're going for. Nice and easy and relaxed. Poo, right? Not too loud. It doesn't need to be right. Easy. And then um, additionally, one thing that that uh, Roy would talk about, actually, uh, one thing that Roy Popper would talk about a lot um, is don't don't worry if there's a little like air in your sound when you're buzzing it doesn't have to be the purest bah, you know i don't know how easy it is to demonstrate and for you to hear it but like there's there's some air going in there that's okay that's totally fine um that is actually, that's actually kind of preferred. And uh, Stan would talk about that. And uh, I believe uh, also uh, I've, I've heard uh, there's this great warm-up that, that uh, a master class that, that I mentioned uh, in one of my last streams uh, that, that Hokan did. And he was talking about stamp and warming up and buzzing and, and, that, and that error in the sound. Again, he says, don't worry about it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go away. It's fine. Great topic, Josh. Super for sound, maybe as an idea. A Charlier for a Hokan. Um, chicklets. Ooh, chicklets. Yeah. We're going to do a whole chick. We're going to do a bunch of chicklet stuff. And I'm going to have Mike Chicklets on um, at some point and uh, Mark Doolin. And they're going to talk about their entire uh, chicklets books that they have. Uh, some great, great flow studies. Great stuff there. So um, let me pull up this track. And you're going to hear. Just the piano, da, 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 da. and we're going to play through this. It's one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? So it's, it's a couple minutes long and, you know, check in and check out as you need, as you're doing it. And uh, let me get this started. All right. And nice and easy. Not too tight, and with the uh, the poo attack. All right.
I got the piano on the wrong octave. we just let the air take us there that we're not making them too wide of an interval So, that, uh, that was interesting for me because uh, I usually use a, uh, a totally different track that I recorded when I was at over a very long time ago. But I wanted to put some, some visuals up for you, and uh, I recorded it on the piano with me playing, and timing's a little bit different. So, uh, you know, that was, that was me just trying to play along with this. But here's a, here's a biggie, all right? And let's let's look at uh, let's look at a couple of these actually up close because this is really important. Um, look at this one uh, at the very top. All right, so we've got B C D E F. Right, so B to C is a half step, whole step, whole step, half step, and Stamp used to say that half steps are free. Roy used to say half steps are free, and what he means by that is like we we don't have to do anything to play a half step interval on the trump you know on the mouthpiece on the trumpet um you know it, you play the note you blow through it lift the valve play the note on the mouthpiece hear the pitch in your head you know hear it in your mind if you can hear it then it's gonna come out and uh Right, too wide, whole step. So that has a lot of half steps in it. And if you can sit down on the piano and play this exercise and buzz along with it, you're really going to start to to feel where these half steps are, where the whole steps are, and you're going to start to realize, wait a minute. I'm actually playing some of my my intervals a little too wide. Like the signal that I'm putting in, the way that I'm hearing it, is a little wider than it needs to be, or maybe a little too narrow. And as I said, on the trumpet, the trumpet's gonna funnel us to that nearest note because it wants, you know, like a bottle, mm -hmm. it wants to resonate how it wants to resonate. It's a very specific, you know, pitch based on what valve combination you have. The the mouthpiece doesn't do that. So, you know, it is more discerning. That's why it's such a, a fantastic diagnostic tool. So we can really hear, are we doing a half step? Are we doing a whole step? And like, well, okay, so you can say, why does it matter? Like, what's the importance? Well, here's the importance. 
if if you're used to playing the trumpet and you know every one of your half steps you're actually hearing in your mind not as precisely and you're used to putting in a signal that's you know you're you're actually like playing it a little too wide trumpet's going to put you back in place but you're playing a little too wide um or you're playing your whole steps a little too narrow or a little too wide well that means that every single note you're playing uh you're at odds with your trumpet you're not as efficient as you as you could be and you're not going to be resonating as much so you need to you're not going to be in the center of the note as well so you actually have to use more energy and more effort in order to get the volume and projection that you're looking for because it's not it's not coming from that natural resonance so if we're playing if every time we get to a half step you know we're not necessarily playing it uh true uh we're working you know too much we're we're introducing um a barrier and inefficiency into our playing well how many half steps do we have in like one song right how many half steps do we have like in in a gig on one set how many whole steps right like this is the building blocks of what we're of what we're doing with with a trumpet and with playing so this breaks it all down and this little you know piece of metal here with the with the hole in it it allows us to really get to those building blocks to the the fundamental building blocks of okay am i really truthfully playing you know am i really am i really giving the trumpet exactly what it needs and uh that's why i love that's why i love buzzing because it just sets me up in the morning um in order to just make sure that i'm really carefully listening that i'm really paying close attention to the intervals to how i'm playing that I'm really blowing through with my air, that I'm really following through and filling up the notes, that you know all the things that I want to do right, that I'm actually doing right. Now, we can use buzzing then as a, as a tool in our practice, and that is, and that is something that um, I'll do on occasion. You know, I'll use buzzing in my practice in order to really make sure that uh, you know, sometimes I'll get to a, a, a tricky thing and it's like, man, I'm not hearing it so well. And I use it as a way to make sure I'm hearing it. And a hundred percent, if you can buzz it on the mouthpiece, you can play it on the, on the horn. But again, it's not a direct, you know, uh, analog of the mouthpiece to the trumpet. And it is definitely not the same, the lips to the mouthpiece. So, um, I covered a lot of ground here, um, you know, with, with some playing, with some ideas here about, uh, mouthpiece buzzing and lip buzzing so uh anyone here have any questions uh let me know or comments or anything uh definitely want to uh address those and you know thanks everyone for for being here we're not done yet but uh you know i want to make sure if there's any questions uh because i'm sure there's some of you are just hot you know hanging out and, and maybe you got some questions you didn't write them yet but uh you know there's a lot to it and uh, I'll I'll say this as far as lip buzzing and mouthpiece buzzing. It's the first thing I do in the morning um, as part of my warm up. I do a couple minutes on just the lips alone, and uh, working up chromatically from that that double pedal C, you know, low coming up until uh, actually about a, a C in the staff. You know, I go I go pretty high. Um, sometimes it'll just be the G in the staff and then get on the mouthpiece, do what we just did a little more extended. And then, uh, I do the stamp exercises and then, then I'm on the trumpet. Then it's, you know, off the races. Um, but for me, that's just like a great way to start in the morning. So I find that, uh, you know, to, to really be uh, very helpful. So, um, what do you, uh, what do you all think? You know, I, give me uh, give me some comments here. What do you uh, what are you thinking about this? Is this a different way than you're used to thinking about buzzing? Is this the same as what you've heard in the past? Uh, anything that you really loved, or anything that you're like, nah, I don't buy it. Um, super interesting. I wish I had so much information while I was young. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, that's you know that we're never done. We're never done learning. That's why this last week I was so excited, uh, that, that, that Hokan came to town and, 
you know, gave this concert, gave a master class, made sure that I was there. And, uh, you know, gave some concerts, made sure I was there. And uh, just, you know, listening and, uh, and trying to learn from everyone. And, you know, we were hanging out um, after the concert last night. A lot of, uh, a lot of us trumpeters uh, went out after the concert. It was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty terrific hang um, with uh, a lot of the performers. And we talked a little bit about about playing a little, you know, there's a little little geek talk happening there. Mostly they were all just kind of chilling and relaxing and, you know, and uh, and and glad the concert was over. But, you know, we did a little bit of a little bit of a shop talk and, uh, you know, uh, they, they were they were they were talking about buzzing a little bit. You know, there was there was some good stuff happening. So. Um, anyone else? Um, I'm happy to, uh, elaborate on some of these and talk a little bit more about, you know, why I do some of these. And, uh, I did mention that it is easy to overdo it. And this is a, this is a thing that I know a lot of people, um, run into problems and they, they worry and they say, oh no, I've been, I've been, uh, uh, you know, I tried buzzing. It didn't work for me. It just made me tight. A lot of people say that. They're like, oh, no, it just made me tight. And, uh, you know, if you try and... I think it's just because of the name, lip buzzing, all right? It's like lip slurs. A lot of people, they say lip slurs. It's like lip slurs can make a lot of people tight because, you know, like the name makes you think that you need to use your lips in order to get from note to note. I like to call them air slurs. Because I'm using my air to get from note to note. Uh, at any given point, whenever you're playing the trumpet, uh, if you're moving from even just a C to a D, um, you'd never want your chops to reach the note, the next note first. All right? If anything, I mean, ideally, you want it to all move at the same time. But if anything, you want your air to reach the note before your chops do. The mouthpiece tells us immediately if we're doing that. Once we get tight and once we tighten up, it's so hard to it's so hard to let that go. It's so hard to to be relaxed afterward. So, um, you know, that's that's the great tool. It's Right, we can use our air to get from it, and everything is full. It's open, and it's relaxed. Stephen writes, "Thank you for doing this." Even though there's several videos covering lip mouthpiece buzzing, most don't actually cover to this degree. This is a topic I feel very uh, uh, passionate about, and this is something that I've put a lot of thought about, and I've done it every day for the last two decades. So, um, you know, I. I really, truly believe that it's helped me become a more efficient player, a more effective player, a more consistent player, 100%. Uh, play with uh, a sound that is, uh, you know, as, as close to the sound that I want. Uh, you know, it's like uh, I don't feel uh, hindered in my production. Um, thank you for doing these live sessions. Yes, thank you for uh, being here. Um, you know, so I really, I really love it. Um, what are your uh, buzzing book to ease people in the stamp routine? Any thoughts on the Boyd Hood mouthpiece drills? Um, I don't have. So I use the buzzing book and uh, uh, Thompson buzzing book. Terrific. Uh, buzzing basics, right? Um, backing tracks are fun. And he talks a lot about glissandi. And we didn't talk about that today because that's a little more in depth. But. Um, is different than right having uh what stamp would refer to as square corners you know he would make this little marking in his in his uh in his music 
and that was a, a square corners is what he talked about and you know the idea was that you go from one note immediately to the next note that you're not projecting or dragging from one note to the next just like a piano piano goes to a c to a d da it's just one pitch it's the next pitch it's not da you hear how like the end of the note can da it can kind of like get sharp because you're leaning towards it and you're projecting that next note um so that was that's like the the big difference between stamp with the square corners and then like the buzzing book where they do these glissandi but for beginning for for understanding and getting into you know the understanding of it and uh getting the comfort with it uh that's terrific because um it's going to keep us from grabbing with our chops and it's going to keep our air open and full um so i really like that uh yeah the boyd hood mouthpiece drills i i'm not really too familiar with those um i have them but i have i need, i'm gonna check those out i'm gonna look at that um see what we got here chop talk derived from the airflow if this is good breathing is good muscles need to grow um not sure i'm following that completely but i do feel that if you are breathing well if you can do that and you can have a easy relaxed not too tight right uh that supports a good um embouchure that supports proper embouchure and and you know development of the muscles and what you need um contrary to popular belief um we i don't think we need as many muscles as as a lot of people think that we do um I think you I think you really only do if if you're if you're not playing as efficient as you possibly could. Um and I've heard so many I've heard so many pro players uh talk about taking time off and coming back and being like, Oh yeah, no, it's fine, like it didn't take that long. Like, you know, some people get really worried if they take a day off or a couple of days off or, you know, more. Um however, um the that's what I meant. Okay, great. Um, however, I know some fantastic players. Roy, I remember at Overland him telling me one time he took like a like a, a month or two, or he took a, a good amount of time off, and uh, then came back into it a couple weeks. You know, did everything the right way. Um, he wasn't just like you know massive muscle loss or any of that. Uh, I had lessons with Charlie Schluter twenty years ago. For a month uh, I studied with him and in uh, January I think of 20 um, 2003 maybe or 2004 and he would he I remember him telling me that he would take like a month off or two months off <laughs> like he's like oh yeah I'll take the summer off and then like that it would take him a month to get his chops back in shape to be principal of the BSO and it's like wait a minute like that's that's where he was coming from that's like the level of his chops and the efficiency and the ability knowing that he knew what he needed to do with his air and with the chops and that he felt comfortable that he could get him to that point uh in a short period of time um relatively speaking you know for a lot of people if you took a, a month or two months off uh uh i i don't think too many people would be comfortable sitting at a principal in an orchestra uh a month later four weeks later um but if you're really coming from a place of efficiency, then then you don't have to worry about like being over, you know, like like too strong, like you know, trying to like overcompensate. Um, a lot of people do that. I mean, perfect way to look at it is you know, look at any of the Olympic uh, uh, power lifters. Look at you know any Olympic power lifter. Generally speaking, they're like little guys. I mean, they're not like they don't look like wrestlers they don't look, look like like giant bodybuilders you know mr olympic or whatever right um they've got strength though like they you know they they don't need all these big muscles they've got technique and they've got strength you know and it's and it's 
working in tandem um, as opposed to like developing, oh, I'm going to play, do this iso isometric. I'm going to build big muscles and this to compensate for whatever. Um, it's similar with the trumpet. I mean, we do need strength. We do need that. And this is going to support that. This is going to help that. But really, I just find that this like helps us dial in that efficiency. It helps us get to the point where we're using exactly just as much as we need. We're not using more and then working against ourselves. Because anytime that we're overblowing, which is so common, anytime that we are overplaying, so common, um, we're creating extra resistance and extra pressure in the trumpet, and we're working against ourselves at that point. You know, it's 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 counter uh, it's counterproductive, and it may still sound great, but you're going to be tired. You're going to be worn out. Um, you know, if if you're a if you're a experienced player, um, if you've got great ears and you got good strong chops, you could be playing your gig and you know you have to put the harmony mute you pull your slide out right it's a quick change you want to be in tune and then it's a quick change taking it out you take the harmony mute out and you start playing you forgot to adjust your slide uh your ears they're going to guide you you're going to hear the notes you're going to play in tune but like you're holding those notes in place you're working really very hard they're not going to be as resonant and you're going to tire out quickly so you know that's like we can we can play through uh, scenarios that are less than ideal and we can make it work and it's going to be harder work um i like to eliminate that in every situation and scenario possible and that's why i love you know kind of using this as my my daily reminder uh for how i can really play as close to the center of the note as possible and to be as as you know efficient and resonant as possible uh great point the efficiency yeah it really is you know it's ear training um you know ear training cannot be <laughs> overstated you know w w it's never it's it we've never gotten to the point where where our ears are are too developed it's impossible even if you have perfect pitch we can still train ourselves um even more and even more I remember uh, this is a, a great little uh, uh, story. When I was a student at Oberlin, uh, one of the perks was we used to get these great student tickets that, uh, excuse me, that they would give us to the Cleveland Orchestra. And Cleveland is only uh, you know about forty minutes from Oberlin, it's pretty close. So we would drive into Cleveland all the time to hear this fantastic orchestra. And sometimes they would they would let us come to rehearsals. They would have open rehearsals, and okay, then it's a great opportunity to really see how a top pro orchestra works and talking about ear training and you know how high of a level you can get to i remember sitting in an open rehearsal the uh, cleveland orchestra was playing and, and uh, uh pierre boulez was conducting and you know of course boulez is like one of the one of the you know most renowned uh uh composers of of, of his of his era and uh you know conductors and composers so they were playing some contemporary piece because he's big he was big on contemporary music and they were playing some just nuts contemporary piece and just you know the horns like every part is you know, you know just all over the place and they like played some section and i remember like he stopped and then he just like called out he was like calling out individual a couple of individual instruments and then he was like e natural like like b sharp like i mean it's just like he heard everything <laughs> he was like wait a minute i know these i know these pitches that like that wasn't right like let's fix that and another instance they were playing you know some some uh something i think it was like a from another romantic era something you know just nice beautiful lush lush piece and it sounded great to me it sounded great and he stops and he's like yeah you know basses like your this note like it's let's raise it a little like he was just tweaking little bits and it was like it was like removing sunglasses it was like whoa wait a minute everything just got so much uh clearer and so much better and i was like that's remarkable and you know he he was hearing everything in his mind the way that he he could look at the score and hear the score he could look at the parts he knew how they were supposed to sound and of course that's where we want to get 
and we got to work on it every single day. And this is like mouthpiece buzzing, lip buzzing. It's just like a great way to like incorporate it at a basic level with the first thing that we do and like increase and improve our ear training. Now there's a big difference between going through the motions of ya da 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 and ye da 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 right da whole step whole step half step whole step whole step whole step whole step whole step whole step half step whole step right ya da 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 really making sure that we're hearing it and then you're going diatonic that's why on the mouthpiece is diatonic because then you're you know doing the different modes and that immediately it's like boom ear training it's you know you're 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 learning things that you didn't realize you were doing on the horn because you've stripped the horn away you know you you've taken away the the crutch you know uh you know the support system of the trumpet and now you're entirely self-reliant on on what you got to do with this little thing and you know it's like once once the vibration has occurred once it's like once the air has passed through our lips and into this like once that's happened it is out of our control this is physics it has happened like it is gone Whatever we want to do to our sound and our playing, it has to happen before it the air leaves our lips. It has to happen before it goes into the trumpet. It's it's nuts. Like, but that's reality. Like, whatever we want, we gotta create it. We gotta hear it. We gotta hear it. We gotta make it. We gotta create it. We have to like will it into existence, into the mouthpiece, and then it goes into the trumpet, and then we have what we want and that's you know that's that's uh that's not how we always are are taught when we're young and we're learning on the trumpet and we're thinking it's like okay play long tones listen to your sound like what are you hearing like you're listening to the end result that you can't affect as opposed to okay hear it play it like command it make it happen and there's countless countless stories of you know, some of the, the most uh, renowned players out there that never missed, you know, like they were always perfect and they were great. And in the rare instance, you know, that they would like miss a pitch, you know, they would miss a note, like something didn't happen the way they wanted. Like it wasn't the trumpet's fault. It wasn't their mouthpiece's fault. They weren't like looking around. Like they were saying to themselves, man, I just wasn't hearing that note. Like I just couldn't hear it the right way. I, I, I needed to, I needed to hear that better in or because they knew if they heard it better, it was going to come out. And if you can hear it and play it, man, if you can take your, here's a good, uh, you know, if you can take your, your, your mouthpiece and then just get a reference pitch. Right? And then do something like a Charlier or, you know, you're hearing it. You know what it is. You know center to center. And that was the most astonishing thing uh, this past week about uh, hearing uh, Hokan. And I drove down to Indianapolis and heard him play the, uh, the Tomasi. And, man, center to center, like a piano. Just center of the pitch to center of the pitch. Everything was just so resonant. And... He, he could sing anything he plays. He can sing it. He knows exactly where it's supposed to be. And, you know, then he can make it happen. So it's like we got to bridge that gap. We got to bridge the gap between hearing it and then being able to create it. So that's why I love the mouthpiece. That's that's what this whole thing's about. This is why I love, you know, lip buzzing, mouthpiece buzzing. Uh, it really just helps us bridge that gap of what we're hearing and then allowing us to then create it. Um, to make our lives easier so that it's not as, you know, as, as nuts while we're on the trumpet, you know, that we're not working against ourselves. So, uh, any other questions we got from anyone? Uh, I want to kind of wrap this up a little, uh, a little, uh, sooner than later. So if we got any more questions, uh, 
I feel like I've covered uh, quite a bit and more uh, more than uh, I thought I was going to even. But if we don't have any more questions, then uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, thank you all for being here. But before that, actually, before we uh, wrap anything up, uh, I did a poll on the uh, YouTube here asking what kind of live streams you're all more interested in, whether it's fundamentals, whether it's interviews, whether it's improv, whether it's warm ups, whether it's you name it. Um, let me know in the comments. I'm super interested, specifically, what what you know, what kind of content would really be interesting to you, um, or even performance, like whatever it is, um, you know, interest, uh, uh, interested in hearing from from all of you because uh, you know, wanna wanna help y'all, trying to contribute here and uh, you know, uh, make good connections with everyone. So, um, what do we got? Uh, super. Uh, Josh, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun and great information. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate that. And uh, if we don't got any more questions, I'm going to uh, wrap this up. I got some more filming to do for some upcoming videos. And I'm uh, going to, well, it's 6 o'clock here, so I'm going <laughs> to get some get some food uh, coming up soon. Um I will be sending out an email uh, on my email list, I think tomorrow morning. I've been trying to get it finished uh, uh, for the last week and a half. And I'm going to have some of this on there, some of these, uh, you know, from the last couple of live streams that I've done, I, I put together some uh, PDFs, some little, you know, graphics, and I'm going to send some of that out there just to, you know, put some notes out there for everyone. It is... After midnight. Wow, where are you located, Artist Vine? Thank you for tuning in. Um, where, uh, uh, yeah, what uh, what country are you in? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a little late, so I want to thank you even more for being here. It's, you're, you're, uh, you're getting this all, uh, all in, so then you can just uh, uh, wake up in the morning and, and do a great warm-up, and, and it's just going to be fresh in, fresh in your mind. Um, uh, so that's... Uh, that's excellent. Ooh, I didn't we didn't catch that. So, um, yeah. Let me know also, but with regards to buzzing, like, if there's anything that covered that you think would be great as a uh, separate topic, into that as well. Croatia, awesome, amazing. Thank you for tuning in from Croatia. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, well, I think that's. I think that's what we got for today. So I want to thank uh, thank everyone for joining me, for uh, tuning in for this live stream. And uh, try and get some. I'm gonna load some new background music. I'm getting used to this. The it's it's getting better each time. I think these uh, these live stream sessions. So uh, appreciate you uh, joining me here on these early ones that I'm doing. Uh, really uh, uh, love the format here. I love being able to uh, you know. Talk about trumpet, talk about different ideas, share different uh, ideas and topics with everyone. And uh, thank you, thank you. I won't be hanging around here so late if, uh, if, you, if you all weren't tuned in. So uh, appreciate all of you for stopping by. And uh, I will see you on the next session, which is going to be sometime next week. California here, amazing. Yeah, uh, thank you for tuning in. I will... Uh, do another session uh, sometime this next week. I'm going to figure out exactly what it is, but I'll post it in advance and, and all of you will be able to see it. And uh, uh, once uh, once I'm on a, uh, a good schedule with my email up email list, which you can get on my website, then uh, I'll include information about all upcoming live streams. I'm going to do, uh, I'll probably schedule them a couple weeks in advance. That way, you know, people can really prepare for them and put them on their schedule. So, all right. Thanks so much. I'll catch you in the next one.